um, reviewing the homework. So for a patch norm layer of size 10, how many weights need to be learned? Let's simplify this problem for just a second. Let's say we have a batch norm layer of size 1. All right? So how many inputs do we have? 1. And how many outputs do we have? Also 1. So we got 1 coming in, 1 going out. How many weights do we need to learn? 2. 2 weights. And the weights are? Yeah, the batch norm mean and the batch norm, the batch norm variance and batch norm mean. So that's what we're trying to learn. When I say learn, I mean something very specific. I always mean that this is a value that's getting updated via gradient descent, right? So these values are getting learned in exactly the same way that weights in a convolution matrix or weights in a fully connected layer matrix are getting connected. They're getting learned. Right, so we calculate the, the gradient and update the learning rate, the learning rate. So does anything change if we increase this to 10? Willa? So still two weights. And this is, and I admit, Confusing. So, if we've got 10 weights coming in, we have to also keep in mind we've got a batch, right? We've got a mini batch. So we've actually got kind of some depth here. So I'm going to kind of look at it like this. And that's really how it's represented, right? It's a tensor. Um, we're going to have 10 inputs. And this here is the batch size, right? So when we talk about the batch mean, we are talking about for each input individually, what is the mean of these 10 values? What is the standard deviation of these 10 values? And then the same thing for the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. So therefore, we're going to be learning a vector of means and a vector of standard deviations. In fact, 10 of them. Right? So 10 means, 10 standard deviations, one for each separate input. So 10 times two weights, and these are vectors. Does that make sense? All right. Assume we have this batch norm layer of size 10, let's say. When we, s yeah. No. Actually, I'm not sure why um, they're going to be because if I would have the batches and calculate the mean and standard deviation from So basically what we're doing is this batch normalization. And here's what we're doing. We are saying Let's just make one in and one out to make it simpler, okay? We are saying we've got a batch of size 100. So the values coming in range all over the place. And this batch may be not different from the next batch, may be different from the next batch in terms of those means and standard deviations. So what we're going to do is we will normalize this many batches mean and standard deviation to a learned mean and standard deviation. Right, so this is what I've been calling sub b. Right, for this batch, this is the actual mean coming in and the actual standard deviation coming in. This is what I call this BN for batch norm. This is our desired mean and standard deviation. To begin with, this is random, just like any parameters that we choose are random. But over time, it's going to be learned, right? So as we get over to our loss function here, as we're looking at our loss, 
eventually this loss may say, you know what? I'd like at this layer, the mean of this coming in to be 50. That works really well for me if this is 50. If I've got a batch coming in whose mean is 20, we should adjust it so that it's 50. If we've got one coming that's 1,000, adjust it down so that it's 50. Okay? To begin with, it'll be random, but it'll learn over time that it wants to be 50. So this is what we've got at training time, and this is what we desire. And uh, when is the number of batches, not the size of the This is the number of inputs. And this is the number of inputs, not the batch size. So the batch size could be, let's say, 50. So we've got 50 values that are feeding into the mean and the standard deviation. Yeah. And the number of inputs is based on the size of the previous layer? Yes. So when we talk about the size of a layer, it's the number of outputs of that layer. So in this case, our batch norm uh, layer is of size one because we have one out. Let's call this outputs. So our batch norm layer is size one, and the previous layer is also size one because we know it's spitting out one value. You with me so far? And then let's go over this formula again to make sure we get this. All right, so every one of our values, let's say we look at x. What's the shape of x? Let's say this is the x coming in here. Uh, really, it's the a sub. So let's say this is layer k minus 1, layer k. So let's not call it this. Let's call it a k minus 1. What's the shape of a k minus 1? What's its width? Fifty, that's a reasonable guess, but it's not quite right. So if we weren't doing batch, remember way back before, way back when, when we were looking at our x, w, plus b, right? What was the shape of x? Was it uh, multiple columns or multiple rows? It looked like that, right? It was a one by something. So this is if we had 10 inputs, it would be a one by 10. If we have multiple, back, multiple items in the batch, we get multiple rows. So every row is a new instance in the same batch. So here, a at k minus one is gonna be one by 50. Instance, training instance 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 50. Wait, I think I'm a little bit confused. Okay. So does this mean that like, every data point in the batch is being passed through the neural net all at once? Yes. Love that. Okay, so remember when I said it's free on the GPU to make your batch size big? Sorry, how did I describe that? Um, processing one item in a batch or 100 items in the batch, as long as it fits in the GPU, is free. And the reason for that is we are doing it simultaneously. Oh, so really in one batch, there's only one pass through? There's one forward pass and there's one backward pass. But instead of operating on a bunch of items like this, where this is X looks like this, and then A1 has the same form, and A2 has the same form all the way through. We just, where this is x1, you know, training instance one, training instance two, all the way to training instance j, for however many will fit in the batch. 
And so then is there an individual loss function computed for every entry? Yeah, way? we create a loss fun we create a loss function like for everyone. Or? And we, well, there's actually a gradient computed for everyone. And then it gets averaged. Okay. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. So we have to push the gradient back. So the gradient comes back again as this array. So we have not just yeah, it's the loss for a particular training instance. I'm looking at what its gradient is. Right. So when we're training the model, are we calculating the variances uh, mean based on the entire batch? So this is the entire batch. Sometimes it's called a mini batch. In this case, it's the 50. So we're going to take all 50 of, so let's go back. We'll get rid of this a moment, and this a moment, and here's where we're at. We're at this 1 by 50. Right? So this is a, so a k minus 1. The output of layer k minus 1 looks like this. The size of the layer is 1. We've got 50 training instances. So we will calculate the mean and variance for all 50 of these items. That is mu sub b, sigma sub b. Then what we do is we say, OK, a at k equals a at k minus 1. And again, this is a vector operation that we're doing. And what do we want to do? We want to normalize. We don't like this mean and standard deviation. We like this mean and standard deviation. So we've got to get rid of this mean and standard deviation by subtracting the mean right, for the batch, dividing by standard deviation for the batch. And now, what's our mean? Right here. Say again? Zero. Zero. And our standard deviation? One. But we don't want zero and one, do we? We want these guys. So undo it the other way. Right? Multiply now by Bn, the learned one, and add the mean. So these guys are learned params. By learned again, I mean they, just like the weights and just like the biases, get adjusted via gradient descent using a learning rate, using optimization algorithm, and so on. We might have momentum associated with those, everything. Right? It's just another one of these learned weights. These guys are calculated per batch during training. Now, if we all of a sudden say there's not just one input, there are five inputs, then all of a sudden there are five of these learned values. And of course, we're having to calculate five values here, too. Five more of these. Sent. I think you uh, got lost there. So we're taking the mean of our batch and the standard deviation of our batch, and then we normalize it to what we've learned from the whole data set. That? Not what we've learned from the whole data set, what our neural networks want. Okay, so when it says, when you, when you put sigma there and the, that mean and sigma, that really is standard deviation. If they could learn, how does that? Uh, let's look at the mean because it's a little clearer, right? If we're taking a value whose mean is zero and we're then adding, right, this is a uh, a set of numbers, right, whose mean is zero, and we're then adding this number, that is now the mean of all these numbers. S same thing is true for the standard deviation. So we're, we're, we're scaling and, tra and translating this vector, these values, to produce so these we're, values. We're, we're, uh, the net's going to learn to normalize in its own way that it's good. Yeah, it's going to learn to normalize it in its own way. What we really mean is to learn these two factors, which really means a, as it processes every batch, let's say once it's learned it, it's going to be seeing the same mean and standard deviation each batch. It's like that's not going to be changing. 
Practically, it's still going to be learning it, so it's going to be moving. But it's not going to have these wide changes just because I have different batches coming in. And it's going to adjust towards, it, would it want to go towards, head towards zero as the mean? It it's going to want to go whatever it wants to go to. <laughs> whatever works to reduce the loss. Can't, can't get more specific than that. All right. You uh, usually add an epsilon on the bottom. You will usually, yeah. Add in an epsilon in case this is right. If you do a batch size of one, then this is going to be zero. I'm not going to be so good. Yes. All right, let's do question two. And then I want to come back to this because question three is relevant. So if we have a batch normal layer of size 10, what is the size of our previous layer? 10. If we're outputting 10, we got getting 10. Okay. What's the size of the next layer? Well, could I have. A thousand neurons here, fully connected to there. That's fully connected. I could, right? I could have a fully connected layer of a thousand following a batch norm of size 10. I could have something of size 10. I could have something of size 5. I could have whatever I want. Does that make sense? OK. Just like if we didn't have this batch norm layer, this guy's outputting 10, and it could go into whatever a layer of whatever size we want. Okay. So what we're talking Excuse about me? the previous size of the previous layer, we're talking about the output size. And then for the next layer, we're talking about the input size. No, the input size of the next layer has to be 10, because we know we're outputting 10. When I talk about the size, I always mean the size it's outputting. Okay. Like if I'm talking about a soft max of size 1,000, it's 1,000 probabilities that it's, that it's, that it's generating, right? could have unknown number of inputs. So size of a layer is always the number of neurons or the, or the output. So now we get to the question, we're predicting. What are we not doing? We're not training, OK? We're predicting. That is for training. Right? And we're going to do a backward pass, too, through all this. And what's going to get updated in here? These two values during the backward pass. These two values, if we have a single input, and these however many values if we have more inputs. But during prediction, we don't have batches anymore. When when we're doing training, we're really careful, right? We randomize our, our batches. We make sure that we don't give it all of the dogs for the first half of training the epoch, and then all of the cats in the second half of the training of the epoch. Okay, if we're just trying to distinguish dogs from cats, because otherwise, what'll happen in the first half? What's it going to be learning to do? It'll predict dog. It's like, I know what to do. I just predict dog. I don't even have to look at the picture. It's a dog. And then you start switching and you have cats in the second half. What should it learn to do? Predict cats. OK? So we're careful to mix it up so that we don't get globs of batches that are sort of all the same. However, at prediction time, we have no such guarantees. Right? It might be we've got a neural network and we've decided we just got a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of pictures of cats and we want to go categorize them. Right? Or we have just a bunch of pictures that happen to be cats and we're categorizing. So it's very possible that if we happen to feed in a batch of things to be predicted, how do I want to say this? I guess here's what I want to say. When you are predicting, you want to do the same thing to your data that you did at training time. A good example would be 
if you do any sort of input normalization, right? any feature normalization where you scale things or anything else, you need to make sure whatever you did at training time, you do the exact same thing at prediction time and at test time. Okay? We want to do the same thing at prediction time that we did at training time. We know these values we'll be doing the same thing with. The problem is these values. Right? We kind of want to know what these values were and use these values. We do not want to be using the mean and standard deviation of the batch we happen of things we're trying to predict. Okay. In fact, here it says we're predicting a single input. So therefore, what do we know the standard deviation is? Zero. And the mean is whatever the value is, right? So do not use our mini batch mean and standard deviation at training time. All right, at, at prediction time. So at prediction time, use the learned BN mean and standard deviation and use the approximate. Calculated means and standard deviations from training time. What does that even mean? Well, just use the ones we had. It varied, right, from mini batch to mini batch to mini batch. We got different values for these, right? First batch had different ones, second batch had different ones, third batch had different ones. But if we kind of average them together, that'd be sort of what we were doing at training time, and that's the same thing we want to do. So, save, let's say, an exponential moving average. At training time. It's not learned. It's just calculated and maintained. Yeah. So for using the learned, uh, mu and sigma of the VN. Don't we have like 50 of those in this case because the batch size is 50, but in that prediction time, we only have, oh so wait, no, we have 20 of them. So hold on a second. For this input, how many means and standard deviations are we? Uh, okay. One each, right? Yeah. It's only if we had more inputs, yeah. and then everything would be fine. So does that explain it? Yeah, I guess like my, my question is coming from like the answer to, to Okay, so the um, answer one, here, if we have 10, so let's look at this. We have 10 means, uh, oh, wait, okay, 10 no, standard deviations, yeah. 10 learned means, 10 learned standard deviations, 10 saved means, 10 saved standard deviations. Right, because we're not doing this right at the, we're not doing this to x before we feed it into the network. We're doing it at the same point in the network. Right? Yeah, same exact point in the network. So we take x. X comes in, it goes through all our layers. We finally get to K minus 1. Now we have our A, K minus 1. That's the one where we now say we're going to use the same formula, except we don't actually calculate these two values. We used our saved moving average value. And then multiply by a learned, add a learned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are there any questions? So basically, that's what it will do. It will use these saved moving averages of these, and then it will plug them in that formula. Cool. So for each of the inputs, it's applying the same exact, because it's applying both the average one and the batch norm. It doesn't change between each of the inputs, right? For each of the inputs, think of it this way. So these are actually vectors of 10. 10 means 10 standard deviations. Because remember, we have, we decided 20 weights that were learned. So we have 10 learned means, sorry, 
These are the 10 learned means, 10 learned standard deviations, 10 saved means, 10 saved standard deviations. All right, let's ask the same questions except with dropout. For a dropout layer with 10 inputs and dropout probability of 70%, how many weights need to be learned? So 70% of you got this right uh, in expectation uh, of the ones I graded so far. So all of you say your answer. Ready? One, two, three. Zero. zero. There are zero weights to be learned because the dropout layer doesn't have any weights. It doesn't learn anything. It just drops. That's what it does. If we have a dropout layer, so we've got our x coming in. We've got layer k minus 1. We've got layer k, which is our dropout. And then we've got our next guy. What's the size of this? Number 5 says assume a drop a layer of size 10. So this is size 10. How many inputs are coming to this? There are 10 coming in, and there are 10 going out. But why aren't there 7 going out? Yeah, don't say layer, because we're not actually dropping the whole layer. The dropped values, when we say drop, we don't mean like they just, we take them out of the matrix and shrink the matrix. We set them to zero, right? So therefore, if it comes in, may be something like, you know, one, two, seven, three, five. And when it comes out, may be one, two, zero, zero, four. Sorry, five, right? So we dropped two out of five of them. So less than the 70% we thought, but random numbers this could be, right? So the output is still size 10. There are 10 outputs. But, so this size is 10, 10 outputs. This size is 10, 10 outputs. This size is whatever. Right? Depends what this layer is, how big it is, what it does. So no weights to be learned. Previous layer size 10, next layer, whatever. And now we are predicting. Again, that's a really important word. Right? We are not training. During training time, this is indeed what happens. It will set with 70% probability, set this one to zero, independently, 70% probability, set this one to zero, and so on and so on and so on. So an expectation, if we have 10 inputs, three of them will be non-zero. Right? An expectation could be all 10 zero, could be non-zero, depends on our random number. But that's at training time. So at training time, drop each input with probability 70%. Could our input look like this? where it's 10 wide and 5 high, what would that mean? That would mean a batch size of 5. One question for dropout is, if we've got, let's say, some numbers in here, 1, 5, 7, 3,
do we drop out the entire first column with probability 70%? Or do we drop out every item in the matrix independently with probability 70%? And you could do the former, but you normally do the latter. So every one of these independently, 70% probability. So we're not treating every item in the batch uniformly. The first item in the batch may have five of them set to zero, the next may have two set to zero, the next may have four set to zero, and so on. But that's all at training time. At prediction time, or inference time, we don't drop. So don't do anything. Did you have a question, Nick? No. Says, we do something. Because if 70% of these values in expectation were set to zero, the next layer is getting a certain amount of input, a certain magnitude of input. And if we don't drop out at all, at training time, the output of this is going to be just a lot bigger. And so therefore, we need to say that an expectation at training time, the magnitude of stuff going in, you know, the totality of what's going in, is the same as at prediction time. So scale by 1 minus 0.7. So every value coming in, this will turn into a 0.3, this will turn into a 0.6, this will turn into a 1.5, and so on. So they all get 30% as big as they were coming out of here at prediction time. So both dropout and batch norm act differently at training time versus at prediction time. Most other layers do not. Um, in CARES, is that done automatically, like the scaling itself? It's done automatically, yes. And in CARES, there is a flag that basically tells you what mode you're in, so that you could do something different. So, okay. obviously, given that you want to scale by, or by that, just because that's what the next layer has been used to like, receiving, um, is it possible that, you know, uh, or maybe we have a log of like how often certain columns were actually dropped and then we scaled each of those columns accordingly, or is it something we're just applying them accordingly? Well, we're just, we're just doing an expectation. Okay. So we just, yeah. We blindly do it. Could we do the scaling at training time? Yeah, we would just, at training time, and so at inference time, we're making it smaller. Conversely, what we could do is, at training time, make it bigger. Again, so that they even up. Um, and that would work. One advantage of that, actually, is if you wanted to have a dropout that changed over time, then you could just change the scaling at training time over time to match whatever your current value dropout is. Right? So you might say, I'm going to start at 50% dropout, and I'm going to take that down to 20% dropout as I'm going through my epochs. And so you could just both change your dropout percentage and then change your scaling. Not as easy to do at inference time because you don't have a single dropout that you were training on. All right, quick review. Uh, we've got a That's a cat, sort of. All right, and so we're feeding this into our neural network. And we've got one category that's cat. And we want to know, what is it about this image that made it a cat, that, made it, that was of most interest in making it a cat? Right, 
So this is the heat map. This is I, our image. And we want to know what part of this mattered and what part of this didn't matter. So this feeds into a loss function, right? But this cat, if we look at, I'm going to call it like A sub cat, whatever the output was of that particular um, uh, neuron at that layer, I don't really care if it was before or after softmax, before or after the softmax, particularly. But I just want to know what could, what about this image, which pixels most affect us? determination. And that is just the derivative of a sub cat with respect to the image. Let's just look at maybe an i, j, so for a particular pixel. So that tells us the top left pixel, if we increased it, a little bit, the red component, how would that affect catness? The whisker pixel here, if we increased it a little bit, how would that affect catness and so on? And we do that for all of the pixels. And we would what? We would want to do, let's say, an absolute value of this. I'm going to say C for color because we've got a color in there too. And we want to, what else do we want to do? We want to take, let's say, a max over the RGB colors. So we'll get a single value for every pixel location. If it's big, that means that this affects catness. And if the closer it is to zero, the less it affects catness. Because you can really imagine, right, taking an image, looking at the output of that cat um, neuron, bumping up one of the pixels, the R value, by one, and seeing what happens to the cat. And doing that for every single pixel and trying it also for Gs and for Bs. That's basically what we're doing, but we're doing it in parallel using gradient descent. Or not gradient descent, using the gradient calculation. We're not applying this more than once. So that gives us a matrix. Big values affect catness a lot. And then small values affect catness a little. And what would be really cool is if we could overlay this with our picture. So in order to overlay it with our picture, we need to get us some values between 0 and 255. Right? So we have another image we can put on this. The range of these values is lower bound. 0 because of, of the absolute value upper bound. Unknown. So let's scale based on the mean instant deviation. Right? So scale by mean and the standard deviation, basically of all these matrix of values. And we want numbers between 0 and 255, so maybe we'll make the middle, the mean be 128. Right? So we'll do something like i equals i minus the mean of i divided by the standard deviation of i. This looks familiar, right? We're scaling it to a zero mean unit standard deviation. We'll multiply by the standard deviation we want. Uh, I don't know, maybe we will do a range of four standard deviations. 
So we'll so from zero to two fifty five, we'll represent two standard deviations below, and this will represent two standard deviations above. So we'll do like times sixty four plus one twenty eight. Right, Sing one standard deviation is sixty four. Two standard deviations will take down to zero, and we probably need to clip this to zero and two fifty five for the stuff that's way outside the standard deviations. And maybe this isn't the right number. Maybe we'll find a lot of stuff is pegged to standard deviations above, and we want to actually distinguish it, so we would reduce this number. But this gives us a number we can actually look at as a picture, right? And in fact, we can overlay it here, and we might find something like Flat, right? If we overlay it. Questions on that? Did, did you ever do this where you looked at like groups of pixels? Because doesn't this like, not even tell that much about like the shape it's looking at, but just kind of like the color of the, of the pixels relative to the direction? Well, it's not just the color of the ones around it necessarily. Um, it certainly matters what the ones around it are, right? If you had, I don't know, something that was uh, whisker colored over here, it really wouldn't care, right? Because in the earlier parts of the neural network, it's not finding features that kind of look like whiskers. And so it's, it's not lighting up and saying, oh, this is important. Um, it's... If, if I understand your question, I guess what I would say is that the neural network in here right, is going through and has low-level features, higher-level features, higher-level features, higher-level features, very high ones like it's caddish. Um, and that is taking care of the determining whether this is part of a group of something else. The other thing we talked about was adversaries. We want to take that cat and turn it into a mushroom, right? We want it to be recognized as a mushroom, but still have it look like a cat. And so the idea is here we will use gradient descent. We're actually going to change the picture, right? So if we have here mushroom then we know there's some A sub mushroom, right? So we would go through a loop. I say I prime equals I. So we started out the same. And we now calculate the gradient equals the derivative of A sub mushroom. The neuron that's spitting out how mushroomish this thing is, with respect to I prime. And so that says the gradient says if we increase one of these elements of I prime, that increases mushroomness, right? And we want to be more mushroom. So we're going to say I prime equals I prime plus some lambda times the gradient. And we could just do this while I prime is not a mushroom. Exactly. The neural net is staying the same. We're just changing the picture. We're still going through forward and backward propagation. But what we're changing is not the weights of the network. We're changing the actual input. How are we sure that we're not distorting the picture too much? Because the goal is that the picture still looks like a cat to human, right, for the neural net? Yeah, so what we could actually do is let's create a loss function that is something like how much of a mushroom is it? 
class? How different is it? Uh, let's say the mean squared error between i and i prime. Let's see. Minus some percentage here. So instead of doing the derivative of a mushroom, we'll do the derivative of the loss. To, so that we will try to increase the mushroomness, but decrease the difference between i and i prime right, on a pixel squared basis. So if we move a, if we move a pixel by five uh, units, uh, that'll be penalized a lot more than moving two or three different pixels by one or two units. Does that make sense, what I'm doing here? And I want to make sure that a big loss, so since I'm adding here, I want a high loss. And high means mushroomish and not very different. I guess visually, how does this sort of like manifest itself? I mean, if we have we have this sort of thing that looks like a cat, if well, they're out for this, going to be something that looks like a mushroom superimposed on a cat. It's going to be like a cat or a mushroom off in the corner, and the cat just sort of gets diluted. It'll look just like a cat. Basically, what'll happen is maybe somewhere up here, it's going to manipulate some pixels in to, to look like a mushroom, but it's going to be just the lower order bit of the image and enough that you'll just never notice it. So, I feel like it's not ideal. Like we wouldn't want something that looks like a cat or a human be a mushroom. Yes, yes, yes. So, how do we combat that other than you could like, Someone do mentioned the other day, right, which is do that same thing. Basically do a lot of data augmentation on your training. Yeah. Go ahead and train this to look like a mushroom and then feed it through and say, this is actually a cat and it'll update the weights for that. Um, but then couldn't you just do this again and it would come up with a new formation that would be Yes, like yes. It's, it's, yeah. It is an unsolved problem. And there are even ways of what if you don't have access to this neural network? You don't have access to the weights. You can still do attacks, which is, I think, pretty interesting. So, and you can do attacks in the real world. Right? There are little stickers that like, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think stickers they put on the shell of a turtle that made the turtle be recognized as something just completely differently. Or really stop signs with little carefully crafted things on top that make it read as a speed limit sign in the real world. Is the only positive application of this for better training your network? So can it be used for good and not evil? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, there's no real good use of it. Exactly, that I know of. Could we like maybe create stickers that could then, instead of like saying stop sign is a speed limit, it would then confirm that stop sign is actually a stop sign. So you could like, like reinforce the fact that like, not only is the picture itself of the stop sign, but now we have this like hidden sticker, or not hidden sticker, but like this special sticker that like tricks the neural network into thinking it's a stop sign anyways. I guess it could be confirmatory stickers, yeah. Just barcodes, you could imagine, it would be one possibility. Yeah. So. Um, all right, and now what if you want to just know what, so we're no longer mushrooms, we're, we're cats. And we want to know what's the most cat-like image. Like, give me the best cat. Okay. That's really a small modification of here, okay? And this is basically, for as long as you're willing to, you know, forever or less, I prime equals noise. So start at I prime just as some, you could be white or you could be some lower to noise. And we'll go back to cat here, right, because we're interested in being cat. And just do this. So just keep saying, make it more caddish, more caddish, more caddish, more caddish. And let's see, I think I have, 
Let me see whether the notebook I have has an example of that. So this notebook doesn't quite have that. However, uh, not the Cholette book, uh, but the Agarwal book does have some visualizations. And it's interesting because it's not like one big cat. It's instead, I broke my chalk. Um, it's instead um, sort of cat features, not real well defined with like a white background around it or something, but you can see cat stuff going on in it. And it's like that convinces it's cat. So, um, we're going to use something similar to this now to look at what are the filters. Of, we want to now, now know what's going on inside the neural network and visualize that. Because okay, what we've done so far is kind of visualize what the neural network as a whole is doing. But now we want to say, like at the first layer, we've got a bunch of filters, and our, you know, a bunch of convolutional filters. What are those learning? Does that make sense, what we're trying to find out? Like, remember when we first looked at convolutions, we could say we could have a horizontal line filter or a vertical line filter or a diagonal line filter. So we don't care uh, that it's a cat. We have our neural net. Let's say it's, uh, in this case, we're going to be using a BGG19. We have layer one. It's a convolutional layer. And we've got, I don't know, I don't remember how many, uh, 50 or maybe 64 convolutions. Right, each of which is three by three by what? If this is at the first layer? Three. By three, right, because this depth has to match the incoming depth, and this is an RGB image. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to basically say so this particular convolution spits out a single plane, right? And assuming the padding is right, it's going to be the same size as this. If this is 160 by 160, right, this is going to be 160 by 160. So what we want to know is what excites this convolution the most? Right? What is it? What makes it the most uh, uh, What input causes it to output big values? Does that make sense, what I'm asking? So like if, I had, if this were a horizontal line convolution, presumably it'd be you know, stuff like that would make it most exciting. And if they were vertical lines, it probably wouldn't care that much. So we can look at something similar to this. The real difference is we're going to look at what is the output of the, the convolution kind of of interest. Let me see if I can show this a little better. So we have 3 by 3 by 3. We have 64 of these. I'm just making up the number 64. I don't remember. And so the output then is going to be of what shape? If we're feeding in a 160 by 160 by 3, we have 64 3 by 3 convolutions. Our output is 160 by 160 by 64. And each plane is a single 
feature map. Right, that's a map for this feature of what's going on in our picture. And so we will take basically the derivative of this with respect to our original input and see what inputs make it go up. Let me show you some code. So this is, I will put a reference to this on the uh, schedule. Sorry, I have a correction to make. What we're going to look at right now to begin with is the cat. And we're going to just look and see what gets activated first. Okay? So we're going to take this cat and we're going to say, for this cat, what does this neural network do? So what do we want to represent? What do we want to see? We want to see in the first layer some of these. We have to look at a plane at a time. There's no way to look at it individually, right? Because this plane might be horizontal edge detector, this one might be a vertical edge detector, this might be something else. That's what we're going to look at. That's our input. That's a cat. We're going to use a feature of Keras where you can get out the output, not just at the end of the neural network, but you can actually ask for any of the stuff along the way. Okay, so we get all the activations. And this is one of the particular activations in the first layer. All right, so it's one of these planes coming out of here. And we can see, what is it doing? It seems to be doing edge detection of some sort. Okay, we can see kind of the edges of some of these things. Another one, right, so this happens to be number 30, is, what is this? What did it seem to be picking out? Yeah, the eyes and a little bit the mouth, but mostly the eyes is what this particular filter is getting. Why do we have a filter for eyes? Because we fed in a lot of animals, right, into this uh, trained network. And so it learned that that was useful. All right, so let's look at some activations. So we're going to start at the beginning. We're not showing all of them. We're just showing some of them. So this is the first layer. And these are low-level features for cats. So like this one is unclear what it's doing. Maybe this one isn't very useful for cats. Maybe this is really a good feature for wheelbarrows and umbrellas. Right? Who knows? But there's a lot of low-level features. This one looks like kind of just the original image, like, like not much has happened to it. This is now the second layer. First layer, low level. Second layer, slightly higher level. Okay. We, and these breaks between them take us to the next layer. Yes. Um, so when, when the correlations happen, right, they have like a low, I don't know what it's called, but scope of um, what they see. So isn't, in a way, isn't the first one quite detailed? Like it's only looking at like yeah, the first one has to be quite detailed. That's a good point. So, so, um, yeah, so what do we call that? The part that basically it can see from previous layers? Receptive field. Yeah, so the receptive field of the first can only see three by three. So there's no way that it can do any global sort of information. The second, three, the second is basically another 
kind of three by three, so it, can, it has a larger receptive field, so more of the original input can affect each of them. So this is the third layer, and there's still much of it that looks like cats, right? It's hard to give an interpretation of what these mean, but a lot of it is still looking like cats. As we get up into later layers, we're going to be seeing things that are less and less like cats. Okay? So there's a little bit that's cattish here and here, but like, what is this? 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 I don't know. This may mean their ears there. I, I, mean, I don't know. But it becomes more and more abstract, right? Concrete, fine detailed, larger details, and more abstraction. Remember how we're doing downsampling, right? We're probably doing max pooling. And so it's, a, it's the fact that we're doing the max pooling. So we're drawing them at the same size, uh, which means we we're actually have to expand the ones that are farther into the network right? because we're shrinking the size of the image. And it kind of makes sense that it's getting more and more abstract because as we get towards the end, some of them aren't even going. So this is, I think, the last layer. So we look at this last layer. Like, there's not a lot that looks like a cat here, is there? But keep in mind, this stuff is going to be fed into, what do we have, one fully connected layer at the end? So this is the information that has to next be used to determine, is this a cat or not? Or a dog or one of a thousand other things. And so it makes sense that it would all be kind of in compressed and abstracted away. I don't want to see whiskers here, right? One of these may represent whiskers or something else. Or maybe there's something, again, more abstract about it's useful for it being a cat. You know, maybe one of these is animal and vegetable and mineral, right? You know, if you think of 20 questions, uh, who exactly knows? Does that make sense? The other thing we can do is, as I said before, we can actually look and see what images make this most active. So that shows which of the particular maps are looking at which particular things, which are doing polka dots, which are doing uh, diagonal lines, which are doing other sorts of things. And the, you, I'll show you a picture on Wednesday where basically these patterns get more and more large and more elaborate as we get later, later and later in the network. Questions? All right, I'm going to give you a two-minute introduction to something, which is basically Keras has callbacks. Okay, one of you used them for not this assignment, but the previous assignment. Um, so Keras has callbacks. Basically, they're just got, get called at the beginning and ending of things of interest. So what's one thing of interest? Say again? So, sorry, now we're talking about training. So we're in the training, so we're on a totally different issue now. We're in a training loop on Keras. We call fit. And we might want to do something. What gets done? Every epoch, right, it prints out information that's done with a callback. We might want to adjust the learning rate over time that's done with a callback. We might want to stop when our validation accuracy starts getting better. That's a callback. So there's a callback that gets called at the beginning and ending of every epoch. At the beginning and ending of training, and at the beginning and ending of each mini batch. So the beginning of training of batch, sorry, of epoch of batch and the end of batch epoch. And training. So if you just look at Kara's callbacks, there are a variety of them that are pretty handy, like 
when the loss doesn't seem to be going down anymore, reduce the learning rate automatically by however much you specify, okay? So that you can more closely follow, find, kind of follow the absolute minimum of whatever space you're in. Um, there are also some visualizations that are there called TensorBoard, where you can actually, you know how you'd like to be monitoring kind of the validation and the training accuracy. And right now you do that by having a bunch of things that get printed out. Right? And if you're running for a thousand epochs, that can take a long time. And only when it's done can you draw yourself a nice chart and see, oh, it seems to be overfitting. TensorBoard is a separate program that runs. It's a web server that shows visualizations and actually reads logs that are written during the training process. So you can live see what your training loss is, what your training accuracy is, what your validation accuracy is, and so on. So in production, that sort of thing is really, really useful. All right, let's go ahead and do the quiz unless there are any last questions. And actually, before you begin the quiz, one thing, and that is on Wednesday. So let's just go over a couple housekeeping things. So Wednesday, we have the last of our convolutional neural net uh, lectures. Next Monday is review for the midterm. And I guess I hand up the midterm then, right? And it's due on Wednesday, I believe. Is that correct? Let's just check that. Don't want to lie to you. Yes, so next Monday, review in class, and then I hand out the midterm, and the uh, midterm is due on Wednesday, yes. So we have a midterm on Wednesday and an assignment due on Thursday, back to Yes, yes, but it's a fairly straightforward assignment. So, um, and, well, would you guys rather have it due the following Monday? All right, uh, I, as if that was a surprise to me. So, all right, I will make it do the following Monday. Uh, so midterm here, and I'll move this one to here. The assignment. The assignment, I'm not changing the midterm. Yes, okay, the assignment. On Monday, I will not have office hours after class. Okay, I have to go down to San Diego right after class. So, but I will have office hours before. Uh, yeah, and I have office hours today. I think that's about, oh, the last thing is for, prepare on Wednesday to brainstorm some exam questions, all right? My favorite exam questions I will actually put on the exam, which would be like, a bonus for those of you who came up with the questions, because you'll probably know the answers. So, all right, so we'll probably spend a few minutes in class brainstorming that with a, with a partner. Okay, do your quiz.